All right, good morning. It's good to be with you guys this morning as Christmas approaches. Um, we're enjoying the Christmas festivities here. I know Jack is really excited about dressing up like a sheep for the Christmas pageant and has been having fun uh, trying to grab the ornaments off of our tree and us having to fight him to uh, keep him from breaking anything, but it's been a lot of fun. Um, so we're in our Advent series entitled Emmanuel, which means God with us, and we're exploring this reality that the birth of Jesus, the incarnation of Jesus, is the ultimate fulfillment of God being with us. And the title comes primarily from Isaiah 7, which we'll study next week as a congregation, but really this idea of God being with his people flows all throughout the scripture. So last week we saw in Genesis that humanity was created to be an intimate relationship with God, but tension and distance was introduced at the fall. And today we'll look further into this tension in Exodus 33. You see, God created humanity to be an intimate relationship with him, but the sin hinders that. How will we resolve this conflict? Will God give up on us? Will God tolerate sinful people? How can we experience God with us? So as we pick up on Exodus 33 today, I want to lay out the background of where we've been so far in scripture before we get to Exodus 33. See, all the way back in Genesis, God, after the fall, was beginning to set up his plan to restore relationship with humanity, to uh, remake the ability for us to have intimacy with him. So in Genesis 3, we saw last week that God promises that Eve's offspring would crush the head of the serpent, the first sort of setup of a, a um, redemption arc after the fall. We see later in Genesis that God starts humanity over with, noses, Mo, uh, with Noah, rather, the one righteous man. We see in uh, Genesis 12 that God speaks to Abraham and starts this covenant with Abraham. And he says to him that he's going to um, bless him and through him bless the nations. And, and this thing all through Genesis and it flows all throughout the Old Testament is this promise from God, this covenant from God that he starts with officially, formally with Moses. And as Dr. Cuffey would say, there are three elements to the covenant that God makes with Abraham. He's going to make Abraham and his descendants into a great people. There's going to be lots of people. He's going to give them a place that is the promised land. And he's going to give them his presence, that is relationship with him. He will be their God and they will be his people. Those are the elements of the covenant. So as we enter in the book of Exodus, let's check in on where we are. Israel has multiplied greatly. There's tons and tons and tons of Israelites that leave Egypt. So the people have been established. Check. The place. Well, they're not there yet, but Exodus marks their um, journey through the wilderness towards the promised land. And so the place is on their way. And presence. Well, that's the question we're going to be looking at today. Is God's presence with them? How will God's presence be with them? Because you see, in Exodus 32, the people have been camped at the mountain of God and, and Moses is up on top of the mountain and he's talking to God and all the people are waiting for God to come back. And it's unclear exactly what, um, what's happening up there, but the people start to get worried and they're like, is, is God actually coming back? What are, we, what are we waiting for? And this is where we get the uh, golden calf incident. They make this idol and Moses and God are incensed. And God says to Moses, hey, Moses, uh, why don't I just destroy Israel and we'll restart over with you, Moses. Moses declines and he goes back down and he um, sort of cleans up the mess that people have made. And then he tells them, he says, but now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. And he goes to God and he says, I beg you, these people have committed a great sin. But now if you would forgive their sin, but if not, then blot me out from the book you've written. And it's worth noting that ellipsis there is not words we've removed. That's Moses actually trailing off. He says, if you would forgive their sin, but if you're going to destroy them, destroy me with them. And that's where Exodus 32 ends and kind of sets us up for the text that we're going to get into today for Exodus 33. So keep that in mind as where we're um, starting in today's text as we read today's text. So then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Perizzites, and I typo there somewhere, Jebusites. 
Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you along the way. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments and I will decide what to do with you. Jumping forward a few verses. Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know who you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and have found faith and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other peoples on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove from my, my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. All right, that's Exodus 33. So to understand what's going on here, we have to understand the dialogue, the back and forth between God and Moses as they kind of negotiate, is the Lord's presence going to go with them? So where's the dialogue begin? Well, it begins with God saying to Moses, Moses, you and the people go to the land I promised, and I will send an angel before you to drive out the enemies, but I will not go with you. He's basically saying, I'm going to fulfill my promise that I made to your forefathers to give you the promised land and to make you a great people, but I'm not going to go with you. I can't go with you. Well, why not? He says, because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you along the way. And then a couple of verses later, if I were to go with you even for a moment, I might destroy you. So what are we to make of this? As a modern reader, God may come off as sort of a, a petulant, omnipotent child who's just going to fly off the handle. Don't let me near you because I might have a temper tantrum and destroy you. Is God so fragile? Is he just going to fly off the handle? Why can't God just forgive them and not destroy them? He's God. Isn't it his job to forgive? Tomes can and have been written addressing this question but I'll briefly touch on a couple points. The first is that it doesn't seem relevant to the author to answer the question of why God would destroy a sinful people or whether such an act would be ethical or not. This passage isn't trying to answer that question. The author and the original audience just accept it as a given. God would be within his rights to destroy a rebellious people. It's not a theology of the ethics of, of God destroying things. And part of what makes this uncomfortable and confusing for us in our cultural moment is that our cultural moment has set us up to think that God should be this cosmic teddy bear whose job is to forgive anything we've done wrong and to make us feel good about ourselves. But this is a God we've invented. It's not the God the ancient Near Easterners would have expected, and it's not the God found in scripture. So it's not a question that the text is trying to answer, but it's still a question that we have. How could a loving God be a danger to anyone? And at least part of the answer comes from recognizing the damage that sin does to people and communities. See, we want forgiveness to be cheap. It seems like that would make things easier. We certainly want to be forgiven cheaply, but forgiveness is costly. Tim Keller says it this way. He says, no one who has been deeply wronged just forgives. If someone has wronged you, there are only two options. You make them suffer or you refuse revenge and you suffer. See, sinfulness introduces suffering into the world. And where we're tempted to think a loving God wouldn't punish us for our sins, the reality is a loving God wouldn't tolerate an eternity for us filled with the suffering caused by sin. If God doesn't eradicate sinfulness and the suffering it causes, there can be no restoration to the garden. 
no healing of all wounds. The good news can only be good news if God is truly going to eradicate all sin. But to do that is costly. I was once in ministry talking to a young woman who wasn't a Christian, um, but was cur spiritually curious, and she had been assaulted. And she was asking me, if I become a Christian, do I have to forgive the man who assaulted me? She says this on the verge of tears. And as she's talking, it became clear to me in that moment, something that was already exceedingly clear to her, the costliness of forgiveness. Forgiving real evil is heavy. It's full of suffering. When you see abuse, exploitation, racism, genocide, do we really look at that and wish that God would just forgive? The better question is not how could a loving God destroy sin, but how could a loving God not destroy sin? There's no hope for humanity if he doesn't destroy sin. There's only suffering. And so because God will and he must destroy sin, we experience our first major point of tension in the passage. Remember, we want God to be with his people, but God can't go with them because he might destroy the people. This is a problem for fulfilling God's covenant. Picking back on, up on the passage, so we skip over a few verses that are uh, talking about Moses' pattern of relating to God and how he speaks to him as he might speak to another person, sort of face-to-face -to -face and the intimacy they have. And then we pick back up in verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and, have found, and you have found favor with me. So do we see what Moses' complaint here is? He says, hey, wait, wait a second, God. This wasn't my idea. This was your idea. At the burning bush, Moses didn't call up in God and say, hey, God, let's go rescue your people. God calls Moses and says, hey, Moses, let's go rescue my people. And Moses tries to get out of it, but God won't let him. This was God's idea, not Moses's. And Moses isn't going to let God get off so easily. In, verse two, in the two verses there, the word you or yours occurs 11 times from Moses. You said, lead these people. You said, I know you by name. Remember, these are your people. Moses is, is boldly going back to God and confronting God. He's saying, I'm not content for you to change the plan and destroy the people and start over. He's insisting God remain faithful to his promise. So you may be at this point wondering, why is God arguing with Moses in the first place? And he seems to lose the argument. Does God change his mind? Is he so fickle that he had a plan and Moses talked him out of it? While it's always dangerous to speculate on the motivations of the divine, it's probably pretty safe here to assume that this dialogue is really for Moses' good, not for God's. God hasn't forgotten the plan. He, he's not confused as to what we're supposed to do next, but he's going through this process with Moses as a, um, to help Moses opt into the plan and really own it and allow us to see what's going on there. So Moses pushes back and says, oh, no, you don't. This was your idea, not my idea. And God relents. He gives in to Moses. Or so it seems. Verse 14, the Lord replies, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And this appears to be a concession. But then we see Moses to go on to press harder as if God hasn't really agreed yet. So what's going on there? Well, Verse 14 is not as much of a concession by God as it might seem at first. The Jewish scholar Robert Alter comments on verse 14. He says, the Hebrew is altogether cryptic and so compact that the whole sentence is only four words. See, our English translation has made it into a more complete sentence than it is originally because God's response is so short and so terse, it's not clear exactly what he's saying. Remember, we want God to go with the people, right? As well as with Moses. But his response of you is in the singular. It's only clear that he's responding to Moses. And in fact, Moses has been pretty focused on himself to this point, more so than focused on the people. In that same two verses where he says you of God 11 times, he uses the word I or me eight times. He's talking about himself, but the people aren't really that in view. He only mentions the people twice in those couple of verses. And it's, it's used in a way that's putting on, God, these are your people. You deal with them. So... God's answer here seems to be promising something to Moses, singular you, but it's not clear what's happening for the people. Moreover, the, the brevity of this statement leaves it somewhat unclear how much presence God is promising. Alter, again, explaining the dialogue that uh, 
says that God's response so briefly and tersely that Moses is by no means certain what God means. Basically, what Alter's saying is, is God's response is something like kind of muttering, I'll go give rest. And Moses is like, wait a second. What did you actually just commit to? Are you actually going with us? I need more commitment than just four muttered words. And so Moses follows up. He follows up with verse 15 and 16. Which um, says, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? So now we get to the crux of the God with us concept. It's not enough for God to be with Moses. The people need God's presence too. And Moses says, if you're not going with the people, don't send us, plural, great. Now we're talking about the people up from here. And what is the reasoning he presents? It's evangelistic. How will the other nations know who you are and that you've chosen us and that you're doing something with us and through us? How are the nations going to see you working if you don't go with us? Remember, back to the covenant God made with Abraham, people, place, and presence. Moses understands that getting the people to the place without the presence isn't enough. They'll just be another group of people. If they're really to accomplish God's purposes, what he promised to Abraham to make Abraham's lineage a blessing to all nations, the people have to have his presence. And now we see both sides of the tension. God can't go with his people or he'll destroy them, but God has to go with them. Otherwise, there's no point. How will God resolve this tension? See, after Moses names this reality, all this is for naught if you don't go with us, we see God fully agree. I will do the very thing you've asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. God grants Moses what he has requested because of his intimate relationship with Moses and Moses' intercession for the people. And we might think that would be enough. Moses has gotten what he wanted. But Moses pushes in again. It's more audacious than that. God says, I'll be faithful and do what you've asked because I know you and love you and have intimacy with you. And Moses doesn't say, okay, Moses asked God to reveal himself more. He says, now show me your glory. And it's hard to know exactly what Moses thought he was asking for here, but it's clear he's being very bold and really pressing God to reveal more of himself, to show Moses more than what Moses has seen, more than what anyone has seen of who God really is. And what's God's response? He says, I'll give you as much as you can handle. God reveals his moral character and his name, but he tells Moses that he cannot see his face and live. Even Moses can't see God's face and live. And it's worth noting this word for face there is the same word of presence that we've been talking all along. Basically, Moses can't even be fully in God's presence or he too would die. He too would die. But God does have an intimate relationship with Moses and reveals himself to Moses as much as Moses can handle. Emmanuel, God with us. He can't be with us or he'll destroy us. He has to be with us. Otherwise, he can't do what he promised. And his solution is an intercessor. Remember what we talked about in the beginning, how Moses tells the people he'll bring their sin before God and say, perhaps I can make atonement. And he begs God to forgive them and says, forgive them. But if not, blot me out from your book. We saw Moses go back and forth with God and God agree to go with the people because of his relationship with Moses. But we never actually saw Moses make atonement. What gives? Did God somehow get around the necessity of destroying evil? Remember what Keller said about forgiving. If someone has wronged you, there are only two options. You make them suffer or you refuse revenge and you suffer. You see, Moses is not the true intercessor to reconcile God with us. He's simply a foreshadowing, a stand-in, a temporary substitute. Moses wasn't the ultimate plan. He couldn't actually resolve the tension, but God had an ultimate plan. The Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh as the true intercessor. One of the people of God who can go before God and represent the people to him, but someone who has deep, intimate relationship with God. Moses says, perhaps I can make atonement and then pleads with God to forgive, forgive the people and if not to blot him out, but he's never blotted out. 
thousands of years later in the garden of Gethsemane, the true intercessor, the Emmanuel goes before God to make atonement and pleads with God to forgive the people saying, but if not blot me out. And he is, he is removed from God's presence. He is blotted out for the sake of the wicked people. God can't just forgive. He has to make the offender suffer or he has to suffer and he chooses to suffer, to bear the burden of suffering that cannot be escaped so that we might have restored relationship with him. See the tension throughout the whole Old Testament, how will God handle his rebellious people and his promises to them is resolved in the intercession of Christ. And so when we wait for Christ this, this uh, Advent season, we don't simply wait for a baby, a gift from God. We wait for the embodiment of and mechanism for God with us. Without Jesus, we couldn't be in God's presence, but through him, we can enjoy forgiveness and deep intimacy with the Father. Emmanuel, God with us through the baby that was born that day. As Advent is a season of waiting and contemplating, rather than leaving this morning with a task to complete or a change to make in your life, I thought we'd do well to leave ready to reflect. So I'm gonna give us a few reflection questions to pick up, pick from, and to meditate on over the coming weeks. The first is to wrestle with this reality at the heart of the gospel. You're so wicked, you cannot be in God's presence save through death, but you're so beloved by God that Emmanuel chose to die to make atonement so that you could be in his presence. For most of us, one side or the other of this is hard to believe. Either we don't think we're actually that bad, we don't think we're actually that broken, or we're sure we're that broken, but we aren't really sure that God loves us as we are. In either case, the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Jesus frees us to joyfully accept both sides of the, that reality. So maybe over the coming weeks, you need to wrestle with that reality about you. The second reflection question is to ask yourself, where do you need to approach God boldly like Moses did, knowing that you have a great intercessor at your side? Hebrews 4 charges us to approach the throne of grace boldly because we have a great high priest interceding and making atonement for us, greater than any that Moses could have offered. Are there things in your life that you've not been bringing to God? Needs, desires, wounds? What does it look like for you to approach God like Moses did, imploring him to remember that you are his people, to remember he chose you and he loves you, to boldly go before the throne and bring your concerns to him? And finally, where do you need to pursue deeper intimacy with God like Moses did in this Advent season? Not just knowing about God, not even just obeying him and doing what's right, but saying, I won't go up from this place until I experience you being with me and I see your glory. Take from that model of Moses, not being content to just know God from a distance, but wanting to see as much of God as you can. I'll give us just a, a moment to sink in those questions and I'll pray for us. Father, we rejoice that you sent your son, Emmanuel, to be God with us. That you were not content to destroy us. You were not content to ignore us and start over. But you wanted to be with us. You wanted to redeem us and restore us to intimate relationship with you. And so you sent your son to provide a way. And Lord, as we examine this text and as we reflect on the incarnation this Advent season, we pray that we would be deeply aware of your desire and your willingness to be present to us and that we would press into you, that we would know you and see you and be transformed by you, that we would boldly come before you and know that we are broken and wicked and yet we are loved. Lord, let these realities sink deeper into our hearts and minds throughout this Advent season. Amen.